So perfect, thank you. Okay. Great question. Okay, I think we're going. Hi, Kathy. Let's see. Okay. It just made gotta... me consent to being recorded. What? Zoom yeah. just made me consent to being recorded. It's me never too. asked me that before. <laughs> it's, it, it's new. We went ahead and turned that on, uh, ah. Counselor. Just we thought, you know, it, it's actually a good thing, you know, and if somebody doesn't want to be, then they they have the option to opt out so <laughs> of the meeting absolutely so, yeah no yeah. that's nice <laughs> Dana hi Kathy <laughs> so hi. we've got some folks hi um let's see who are trickling in um so Megan Perkins uh won't be joining us today she had an emergency she had to um to deal with this morning and then uh, Eric Tobiasen had a conflict and Stacy uh, Witte is going to be joining us till 10 o'clock. So um, let's see, I'm just looking at, to make sure I'm letting people in. So I want to vote. Should I rotate my painting so I have different paintings behind me? Is everybody getting sick of this one painting with the Corvette? <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell it's a Corvette. <laughs> yeah, it's a Corvette in a, cool. in a dress shop window. It's a reflection of the in Redmond of the car show when you're looking in the dress shop window. And But after a while, it's like, oh, I'm getting tired of seeing it. So I think I'll, I'll switch my paintings around. <laughs> Are you the artist? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> this cool. is what I did during COVID. It's a lot oh. of painting. So Wow. Very cool. Yeah. I, I can't cool. do the blank background. There's too much other stuff. So anyway. <laughs> it's really pretty. Thank you. All right. I think, let's see. I think we could maybe go ahead and um, get started. It's 9.02. Um, let me just make sure there's no one else I need to let in right now. Um, why don't we go ahead and we can wait just another minute or so. Um, people join. Okay, so is anybody growing a vegetable garden? Yeah. Is yeah. anybody dragging tiny tomato, tomato plants in and out? Is that what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my little um, lemon cucumbers. I That's what I lost. I had been covering up everything and, and they just didn't make it. So I had to get some more. But uh, yeah, it's this... It's supposed to be nice today and for the next few days. So I'm hoping some growth will happen. And my, I, I started a raised bed garden with my son in Santa Rosa when I was down there. He's like 33 and he's decided he wants to garden, which I'm like, yes. And he sends me pictures and it's like three or four times the size of my poor little garden. Right. <laughs> I have garden envy. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Happy. If it makes you feel any better, we have the exact same growing season as Anchorage, Alaska does. So it's kind of a different <laughs> league growing up here. You and know, it is in the Bay Area. <laughs> it, it is actually worse than Anchorage, yeah. to be honest. It, there's it's just shorter growing season. You know, when we were up in Alaska, I saw how fast everything grows because you have light all day. You know, <laughs> so. Yeah, it's okay. I have the most expensive tomatoes on earth, you know, by the time I'm done with all of yeah. the equipment and, and the raised beds that we put together down in Santa Rosa, you know how lumber prices have gone up? It was three, uh, $450 for three raised beds. Oh my gosh. That's Wait. crazy. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah, well, I, I do the two foot high ones. So, you know, it, it's more lumber than like if it was down low, but still it's crazy. <laughs> I um, was in um, Alaska once, and, sorry, um, I, oh, in Fairbanks and Anchorage, I guess, but I went to a farmer's market in Fairbanks and it was towards the end of the summer. And yeah, the cabbages were like, like enormous. They look like huge watermelons and stuff. The tomatoes were like this, <laughs> like everything was so big it makes up Crazy. for the rest of the year right Lynn mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no it does not make up for I mean you can eat cabbages all summer long and you still have 10 months of winter 
<laughs> and then two months of fog and rain <laughs> with a couple good weeks thrown in. So, so it's a wonderful place. I shouldn't complain, but I do enjoy it a little. For a gardener, it's it's tough to have gone from the home of Luther Burbank, who invented all these plants, to here it was a bit of a shock. So, but I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we could talk about gardening all day. Go ahead, Barb. I, yeah. I did, you mentioned that you had made raised beds in another meeting just last week, Kathy, and I was picturing bunk beds in my mind. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, I yeah, no. And, and you mentioned something about either two by tens or two by twelves. I'm like, wow, she's yeah. building some bunk beds. Those <laughs> kids are, you know. <laughs> Yeah, they were two by 12s. Those would be pretty hefty uh, bunk beds. Ex exactly. No, that's exactly what I've had in my head all this time. Yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad to straighten out the, the record. It for makes you. far more sense. Yes. <laughs> oh, good. We got more people <laughs> while we were stalling. So yeah. I'll shut up now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Why don't we go ahead and get started? We have some folks in the lobby who are not on the sounding board. So I just want to let you know that um, we'll, if you, need to say something or you would like to raise your hand, go ahead and do so. Um, we have public comment towards the end of the meeting. And as we're going along, I'll make sure there's no, none of the sounding board members that need to be in the, as panelists, and I'll be letting you in over time. So, um, so thanks everyone for coming today. We have, um, Megan had an emergency and won't be here. And um, Eric Tobiasen, uh, can't make it. We're waiting on Brianna, um, but I'll keep a watch on the lobby and make sure um, I can let her in when she comes. Um, and then Stacy needs to leave at 10. So, um, so anyway, why don't I go ahead and share the agenda? Um, let's see. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, go up here. So, um, Councillor Campbell, did you want to um, just welcome everyone? Or um, absolutely, yeah. Yes. Okay. Sure. So yes, as Susanna mentioned, Megan couldn't be with us today, but I will happily say welcome and thank you. This is the fourth meeting we have had of this sounding board where today we're trying to look at draft code languages that we believe will help us housing our unhoused neighbors. So thanks to everyone for being here. Should we do just a quick, quick round of introductions today? Sure. Um, I'll just call folks off as I can see them in my camera. If you just want to say hello and if you represent um, a particular group, Hans, would you like to start us off? Thank you, Councillor. Hans Jorgensen, Chair of the Neighborhood Leadership Alliance Advisory Committee. Thank you. Kathy? Uh, yeah, Kathy Austin. Hi, I'm representing the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee today. Excellent. Thank you. Dana? Dana Richards, she, her, hers, and I'm uh, representing the Homeless Leadership Coalition. Thank you. Thank you. Stacy. Good morning. Stacy Witte, Executive Director and Founder of REACH. Thank you so much. Scott? Good morning. Uh, Scott Winters, and I'm representing the Planning Commission. Thank you so much. And then we've got staff here today. Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth Oshall, Associate City Attorney. Thank you. Lynn. Lynn McConnell, Affordable Housing Manager. Thank you. Pauline is with us today. Good morning, um, Pauline with City of Bend um, Planning Department. Thank you so much. Um, we've got Juan. Almeida and Michaela Oliver, who are always hovering in the background, helping to make these digital virtual meetings go smoothly to, to, for us and always so appreciative of the work they do behind the scenes. So with that, I will go ahead and say, Susanna, why don't you introduce yourself and then go ahead and continue on for us. 
Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Susanna Jolder, I'm a senior policy analyst. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Let me share again the agenda just so we all know what we're doing today. Um, so let's see. So first, uh, <clears throat> we're just gonna uh, go through the minutes if there's someone that wants to uh, move to approve the minutes from last meeting. Um, Elizabeth is gonna give us a overview of House Bill 2006 and then also 30, 3261, 30, is that right? Um, yeah, <clears throat> which just uh, passed the state legislature which will affect our work um, a little bit. Um, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna bring up the PowerPoint from the last meeting where we made a bunch of notes that looks super messy, but um, we took the, um, Elizabeth and Pauline and I, thanks so much for their help, went through um, your feedback and developed that draft code that we sent out to you. So what we're gonna do is kind of review what, what we um, thought we heard last time and talk about our code um, revisions that are reflecting that. And then we'll go through that draft code and pick up where we left off and just try and get through as much as we can um, before 11 o'clock. Um, actually, we'll save 10 minutes for public comment um, at the end and then do a wrap up. And then at our next meeting, it will be, we'll actually have uh, three weeks. It, it, uh, it'll be June 9th and we'll be picking up anything we haven't hit on so far. So we'll see how we go this meeting. And then we'll be talking about the RVs as ancillary uses for single family. Um, we'll look at finalizing our very draft code to get it cleaned up and ready to go out for community involvement. Um, and I'll talk about the process for that next, next meeting. Um, so sound good. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop sharing so Elizabeth can talk about the house bills. Excellent. Shall we go ahead and accept a motion to approve the meaning minutes from the last meeting? If anyone would like to make that motion. I'll move. Thank you, Kathy. I'll second. Thank you, Hans. We have a motion from Kathy and a second from Hans. All those in favor, you just raise your hands. And that looks unanimous. Thank you. Susanna? Okay, Elizabeth, I'm gonna hand it over to you to talk about um, house bills. Okay, thank you. Um, I might be having some computer problems. My screen just went blank, but then I came back. So I apologize if I um, drop out here in the middle of talking or the meeting, I will try to get back as soon as I can. Um, so just briefly wanted to share with you, um, cause you may have heard of house bill 2006 um, that is another super citing bill that the legislature passed and the governor signed into law um, just about two weeks ago. Um, so what 2006 does, a couple of different sections, but the, the most relevant to this committee's work, I think, um, is the beginning, which um, requires that a city approve a emergency shelter regardless of local land use uh, laws. Um, if it meets certain provisions in the bill. Um, we had a bill like this last year, um, 4212, 4212 expired, and 2006 is the new 4212. Um, and so what this means is cities, um, Bend is coming up with an application that lists all the criteria from the bill. And um, if a um, applicant meets all the criteria, we are required to approve the application. If that application is submitted uh, before July 1st of 2022. So basically for the next year, it won't be our local land use laws that we'll be looking at for siting of um, emergency shelters, but we will look to 2006 criteria. Um, this bill is only in place for a year. Um, any um, entity that applies by before July 1st of next year if they meet the criteria, they would be able to open, they're required to open within two years of their application approval. Um, and then they are allowed to be a permanent use um, cited under 2006. If for some reason an entity wouldn't meet the criteria under 2006, they could apply under um, our city code, which is what you all are looking at now. Um, 2006 also has a couple other provisions that relate um, to other statutory sections that allow for parking of vehicles for overnight on private property 
as um, or allow cities to allow vehicles to be parked overnight on private property and um, also expands a little bit a different statute about transitional housing uses. And those um, provisions relate more towards the safe parking programs that the city adopted under the municipal code um, earlier this year. And are there any questions on 2006? I could get into the particulars if you're interested, but um, that's, that's the basic overview. Hans? Just curious, is there a sunset on this bill? So the, yes, so the applications have to be received by July 1st, 2022, and the, the provisions uh, relating to the super siting are repealed on July 1st, 2022. So it's not really a sunset, they call it. No, got it. Mm -hmm. um, and the other piece to note about the expiration date is that if a use approved under 2006 stops being in existence, it can actually come back if they come back within two years. So it's, it's, it is a permanent approval, including if a use pauses for less than two years, it can restart again under its old 2006 approval. So just a little bit of a nuance about the permanent nature of these approvals. Kathy, I saw your hand. Well, I just, uh, you clarified it. Um, it's not a sunset of the use of that property. It's the sunset of ap applying. That's correct. There's a deadline to apply. And then as you said, if it stopped for some reason, if it started back up again within two years, it can start back up under the 2006 rules. So great, thank you. That's right. Um, and there was another bill that passed recently and it is 3261. And that bill does not have a sunset. It allows for the conversion of an existing hotel or motel into an emergency shelter without consideration of local land use laws, essentially. Um, and that one does not have a sunset. What's the status of that one? It is signed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, okay. Any um, questions for Elizabeth on either of those? So, um, so it's great that those have passed, um, but it makes our work, um, well, our work still needs to get done because um, these are, you know, temporary kind of clauses. They may continue, but it's important that we keep moving. Um, the other thing we've been talking about as a staff internally is just um, some of these um, shelter types are, are fairly um, controversial and there's a lot of interest when, um, we're talking about them going into neighborhoods and things. And so our feeling as staff um, is that um, it would be better in a lot of ways to go through a land use process where um, you know folks are notified and it goes through the proper channels just so, um, I don't mean proper like that's the only me method, but the land use channels. So it's, a, um, it's an existing use, it becomes um, something that's not going to be subject to a non-conforming status, not that it would be, but there's so many changes with um, state legislation and what may happen, it would be, our feeling is it would be better um, for it to go through a normal land use process, which is, is basically what we're doing with our sounding board work is allowing these through the, our, our code um, so they become permanent uses. Um, I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that, but we'll, we'll see. Kathy, go ahead. Well, my only concern about that approach is it gives a false sense to neighborhoods that they can they can somehow stop it when in fact mm -hmm. they cannot. And it, um, I mean, to me, it sounds like it's allowed by right. There really, it really isn't a discretionary approval. Now, it doesn't mean we can't notify neighbors, but it should be very clear that it doesn't give them a false sense of hope that they can stop whatever they don't like being in their neighborhood, you know, and, and I, I guess I, I feel like there needs to be really open and clear communication um, that it is not, it's not a discretionary thing. And, you know, it, it's possible that there could be input that could help ameliorate the impact for sure. 
but um, I just, I saw Hans nod. I, I think that just needs to be really clear that this isn't necessarily coming from the city council or the affordable housing committee or the planning commission, that this is a state law and this is what's happening. And if you go through sort of the whole usual process, I think in the past, in many cases, when things are meeting the letter of the law, there's not really an opportunity for council to reject it. It would open up a lawsuit. So I guess my opinion is just communicate it, but communicate it clearly so that people understand that this is coming yeah. and they're not giving input to say, no, we, we don't want it. I just want to re reiterate, Kathy, absolutely. I, I think the frustration too many people have, and it's, this is not a land use process when we're talking about 2006 to 3261, but we've seen so many people come to the, the land use process late in the game, too, too late to accomplish anything, and they're misinformed, they're not educated, and so I think we need to get out in front of it so that people have reasonable expectations. It doesn't mean that they can't be part of public comments, it doesn't mean that they can't express, but it probably does mean there's not much they can do about it. And, and I think if we can educate a little early, um, we can get rid of a lot of angst and a lot of misinformation. And it's just, it's just reminds me of what we see so often in the land use process. And this is a different animal, but same rules apply, I think. Yeah, good points. Um, any, anyone else have input? on that um 2006 you know it, it it is good till next year in june um when we did uh we had the applications for 4212 um it was about the same time frame and, and that's when um eric tobiason's project veterans village came through and then the saint vincent de paul one came through so we can probably expect um a few more of these but it takes, it takes a while for people to get um, kind of organized and get funding. So, um, you know, we may not, we might not see like a flood of these applications under 2006 and um, 3261. So we'll, we'll see, but it's good to have that process going and then allowable and then us to keep continuing what we're doing for longer term strategies. So, okay. Um, why don't I go ahead and share again and um, we're going to be reviewing what we heard from you last time, and I'm going to um, show the messy PowerPoint. Again, this is where we are in the process. We're at meeting four, um, looking at, again, the Ben Development Code Amendments. Um, and last time we talked about the three different types of shelters. Um, and so this isn't final. What I'll do is we'll go through really quick these slides and talk about what we heard last time. And then I'll pull up the code I sent with the bubbles on it, because I think it's easier to go through that and make comments of um, Pauline and I are kind of tracking what the draft code is looking like. So we can make comments and changes directly on the code. Um, so what we heard last time is to change the mass shelter to a group shelter. Um, make some changes to transitional shelter and outdoor shelter so that we're not being repetitive in this shelter definition. So we'll walk through that with you on the bubble code is what we're calling it. Um, you had some comments last time, I think they came from Dana and Stacy maybe about um, day shelter, about having an accommodation for a day shelter, but in talking um, with Pauline and Elizabeth and I, and you guys can feel free to jump in, um, afterwards, we felt like we didn't need to maybe create a bucket for that because that's just kind of like an office or a standard operating type of thing. So we didn't feel like it was necessary to create a separate shelter type bucket for that, but you can let us know if we're off base on that. Um, so that's what we took away from the definitions. Um, and again, we'll go, I'll pull the code up and it'll make more sense once we go through it. So we looked at, um, the concept of providing on-site or on-call management. And in the draft bubble code, we've got um, some language in there that we'll go through in detail that we took from our short-term um, short term rental licensing requirements for management, or at least a phone number people can call after hours. Um, 
we talked about parking. We've got some proposals on parking and Eric Tobiasen sent um, some comments to me this morning that I forwarded to you um, while we were talking. So you probably haven't seen them, but I can pull them up on the parking for outdoor shelter types. Um, we added a few things to these, this may provide and House Bill 2006 actually has a list of these as well. They're very similar. Um, let's see. So we'll go through those with you when we pull up the bubble code. Um, and then we got down to, I think, that looking at the RM and RH um, on this table. So we'll pick back up there for the sizing in different um, commercial zoning districts. And then in the mixed use districts, we'll pick that back up again when I pull up the bubble code and we can go back and forth. That's kind of hard to do virtually, but we'll do our best to go back and forth. Um, Scott, you had some questions about the commercial zoning districts and I did create a map. It's not very good. So I'm gonna, I just thought I'd pull it up when we come to that conversation, but I think it was to do with um, uh, limiting the size of some of these shelters or the ability to site them in the neighborhood commercial zoning districts. So we can talk about that when we come back. Um, and I think that's about it. So why don't, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm going to pull up that bubble code and we'll kind of start just going through it and see what your comments are on that. Does anyone have any, Barb, go ahead. Suzanne, are you saying bubble code? Like, <laughs> can you explain that to me? Why Sorry. is it we're calling this a bubble code? <laughs> Sorry, we started calling it bubble code and it just kind of stuck because um, it had the, the document I sent out to you to review. It's Those bubbles okay. will not be in the code, but it was kind of a way to say like, hey, this is where you, we need your input um, okay. here. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, okay. It, to differentiate ahead. it from bubble tea, Barb. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here we go. Okay. Can you all see the the code the with the blue bubbles? It's small. Barb, yeah. you're muted. It's small. pretty okay. small. Yep. So let me make it Can little you make it a little bigger? bigger? Yeah. Uh, like that? Maybe even bigger? There. Presentation okay. mode or something? Um, not with Word. There we go. Yeah? Okay. I think so. Yep. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So let's just start going through this. So um, from what we heard, from uh, you at the last meeting. This is what we understood um, the shelter definitions to be. Um, so a group shelter means, means a building that contains one or more sleeping areas or is divided only by non-permanent partitions furnished with cots, floor mats, or bunks for use as a shelter. Um, so, and we don't have to, I think it helps to kind of go through all these and then come back to them. So. Um, yeah, let's see. So the outdoor shelter is a site on which multiple mobile or permanent units are placed for use as a shelter. And then transitional shelter is a building that can contain sleeping rooms for use as a shelter. So in our code right now, we have a provision for temporary housing and that's where all of our shelter type uses or, um, were put before Pauline, you can jump in if I'm not explaining this correctly, but we don't, we're not gonna, after we're done with our work, we're not gonna need that anymore. And it's gonna be replaced with the shelter definitions. So that's why this is all crossed out. And then shelter means a location for overnight accommodation of people who lack permanent housing. Sorry, my boxes are hiding that. A shelter may be permanent or temporary and is either an outdoor shelter, group shelter, or transitional shelter. So have we got it somewhere in the ballpark? This of course is not completely final, Kathy. I think uh, go back to transitional shelter. Uh, I think you need to say a permanent location that contains blah, 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 blah for individuals transitioning or something because it's very confusing to the public to think of transitional shelter. They think it's gonna be there and then it's gonna be gone. So we just need to clarify that. I don't know, Hans, if you agree, but I think 
uh, neighborhood groups might think, oh, it, well, it's going to be here, but it's transitional, it'll go away. It's like, no, the people in it are transitional, the building is staying. So it just needs to be clear somehow. I think that sounds good, Pauline. Well, looking at the definition of shelter, we put there that it's permanent. So we weren't going to be repetitive in the other three definitions about permanent. I see that. Um, however, I still think it's confusing. The, the tra transitional word itself can cause some confusion. I, I guess it depends on who you think the audience is for this. So, you know, people who are familiar with codes would understand that. But uh, I just want to avoid any confusion with the public that I don't know, maybe I'm overreacting, but I just want to make sure it's really clear. Because if we put it there under transitional shelter means a permanent building, then it seems like an outdoor shelter, we should say a permanent site. And then a group shelter seems like you put a permanent building there. Can mm -hmm. you just put the definition first? So that's the first thing that they read to establish that it's temporary or permanent. Because I, I mean, I understand the confusion as well as trying to simplify the wording in each of these, but maybe if it's just, I think it, the challenge is if you have to go hunt for the definition or find, then you get the misinterpretations and the misunderstandings that then become more laborsome. That's a good suggestion. These we could look at that typically we do it in alphabetical order, but if we put shelter in alphabetical order and then list the three under it, like we do for dwelling, I, I don't know if we do that for dwellings, but we could do something like that. That makes sense to me. I've got kind of a silly question, looking at it from like a provider, what if a provider is able to find a temporary lease or a short-term lease, it's not permanent per se. So does that lock them into having to have permanent um, lease or purchase to set up the transitional shelter? I don't think so because it can be a, a, a shelter may be permanent or temporary. Okay. okay. I like the idea of putting the definition first. I think that helps clarify it. Stacey, I think a little bit more on your question will be what we get into is what is a temporary shelter okay. use. And so if your lease is five years, for example, then you would probably be making an application under the permanent use. Um, temporary use in the code are generally things that are seasonal or a few months at a time. Um, and so it may depend which use, whether you meet the definition of a temporary use or not um, when we get there. Um, but the, yeah, I mean, for restaurants or other kinds of uses, a land use application is not only for, um, you know, people who own a property, it could be, you have to, so it, it's not always permanent as in forever, but permanent as in more than a couple months. Okay, so does that, does that make sense? I think it does, but I, I wonder if, um, for some, uh, Susanna, you and I exchanged some ideas of maybe some sort of a simple matrix that showed the types of shelter, whether they were permanent or transitional. I just wonder, codes can get a little confusing. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe for some of the visual, more visual learners, a simple chart that shows permanent structure, temporary structure. I don't, I think you know where I'm going with this. I just wonder if, it, if there's a place for that. Mostly I'm thinking in terms of the education and outreach piece that we do next month. Okay. Um, Pauline, I don't know that we could include something like that in the code, but um, the, the issue I think with kind of doing the table and I like tables and matrices and stuff is that they get pretty specific. And then if there's a idea that doesn't fall into that line item or is slightly different, then it kind of is like, well, is this allowed or is it not allowed? So we're trying to be in the code, I think as permissive as we can be. Um, I don't know, Elizabeth and Pauline, you can weigh in on that, but um, we can look at the idea of a matrix um, just and maybe that is something that goes out with the public education, but the code behind yeah. stays kind of like in that standard 
Um, yeah, I wasn't format. thinking honestly that it would be part of code because that'd be that'd be aberrant from our practices. But I was thinking in education and outreach, um, you know, different ways to communicate the same message because not everybody learns the same way. Yeah. And I guess the, the table's my fault. I'm a recovering engineer, so I have to apologize for that. <laughs> is it, I, um, I was thinking, is it maybe are we getting hung up on the word transitional? Um, the, yeah, I'm looking at the website united to end homelessness, uh, dot org, and they have different types of, of uh, shelters and they have transitional shelters and then permanent supportive housing. And we're kind of talking about those being one and the same for in terms of our development code purposes. And I'm wondering maybe if it's more, if we define it more geared towards our development code, which would be like, I don't know, individual room shelter or something like that. Just, I'm just thinking maybe we just get away from the word transitional because then that that's, seems what's causing all the, the um, confusion in terms of what kind of a building it's gonna be. And then also it seems to define the type of stay that the, the user would um, have on that. Scott, I agree with you. And I think that the, <clears throat> I, I, I was struggling with that too, because in essence, every one of these shelters, we certainly hope are transitional. We don't expect anyone to stay there forever, but that transitional word means different things depending on who's reading it and what their experiences are or what their interpretation is. I, I'm, I'm struggling with that myself, I guess. Yeah, is there something else? Um, interim? Interim? <laughs> or is that just as bad? <laughs> I think that has the same, same problems with it. Supportive housing shelter, supportive shelter. Um, is the Bethlehem Inn a transitional shelter? I think so. Yeah, people are, can only stay for like six months or something like that. It, it is um, a time limited type of thing. Maybe that's maybe that's the word, Kathy, time limited or something. But we've like also, that. sorry, Hans, we've also talked about not in the code putting limits on length of stay, but leaving that up to how the operator um, works with their funding or their program. Um, I think if we could find a word that conveys something about the site characteristics, like the individual sleeping rooms, which is actually what would distinguish what we're calling a transitional shelter from a mass shelter, right? A mass shelter is many people in one large room and a transitional shelter is individual sleeping rooms for a smaller number of people in each room. Um, and so we we struggled with this, and I think we've talked about this at a couple of meetings of what is the word that conveys individual sleeping rooms? Um, because all of these could be transitional in some way, right? For the people who are staying at them. Does like Portland uses um, short-term shelters? Um, and then they also use mass shelters and outdoor shelters. I don't know if there's a benefit to kind of sticking with terms that are recognized, um, you know, within the state versus coming up with a unique term um, that many may not be familiar with. So just passing along the short term. Is supportive a word that like supportive housing in my world is very normal or <laughs> I hear it a lot, but is that common for the rest of everyone on the call? Does that make sense? Because that is, it's, because any of those words that are transitional or temporary, they all have this time definition associated with them, whereas supportive is more about the services provided. Just a, an idea. How about something more uh, cheerful, like family slash individual <laughs> shelter, you know, that indicates that it, that there are aggregate units within a room or something. Um, I'm all for getting rid of the word transitional, but I agree it's a problem figuring out what to replace it with. The only uh, thing individual and family shelter, I kind of like that. Yeah. It, it, when you say that, because again, we're, we're not talking about the services, so these buildings can operate on a basis where people can only stay temporary or they could stay there long-term. You know, we're dealing with the actual built um, 
right. kind of product. And so uh, I think the, but to Kathy's point, I think adding a little bit of um, something. Humanity. That, yeah, so adding a little bit of humanity to it makes it, is a good, is a good bridge to that. And I don't know, I so like either individual and family or. Individual and family or family and individual, either way, I think would, would convey the fact that physically there's a room for these people as opposed to the group. So I'm just gonna ask Elizabeth because we do not define family in the development code and we've stayed away from that. In fact, uh, yeah, every reference to family is proposed to be taken out of the House Bill 2001 amendment. So when we say multifamily, we're changing it to units because we're talking about units. We're not talking about families for the most part and we don't define family. How about individual unit shelter? Or we could do individual room since we use unit to describe the outdoor shelter. Oh, true. Units. <laughs> individual room, that sounds good. And, you know. I'm good with that. I think it's generic enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah. specific. Um, no, have another question that's kind of related <laughs> to my Bethlehem Inn question, which, so somewhere in here, it says, overnight accommodation, I believe. Um, so at the Bethlehem Inn, folks have accommodation for longer than overnight. They, if I understand their model, they, folks just cannot be in those rooms all day long. Um, maybe that is a difference between the types, or maybe I'm just overcomplicating, but. I think we have to keep in mind that it's not necessarily an individual room. There might be two, three, or four people in a room. Yeah. As in the Bethlehem Inn. And just one other note, supportive housing, like to me is where there is some assistance with those that might be experiencing um, mental health conditions or any kind of recovery. So it comes, th that definitely conjures up uh, services that are for our more vulnerable populations. Thank you, Stacy. I was actually thinking the same thing about using the term individual room um, for that reason, because there's often more than one person um, even in so maybe separate room shelter. Yeah, I was thinking separated room shelter. I'm just looking at um, House Bill 3261 to see if they define they have a term or something. Multi room. Multi room. Oh, that's that a good work. one. That's, that's good. Multi room. <clears throat> yeah, because I know with Bethlehem Inn, they might have four unrelated women in one room. For sure, mm -hmm. I've I've seen that as a, in the tour. So, mm -hmm. and Barb, I think what you're thinking of is they come in for dinner. Uh, I'm at Bethlehem Inn. Um, they have a a, a, a a kitchen and dining area that they can access, but they're not supposed to come in until you know after work. And there's an after school program for the kids, but I don't think we have to get all that specific necessarily. I'll just jump in. I think the intent of having overnight accommodation in the definition is to clarify that people can sleep in these locations versus an office or something that's typically over, only open during the day. And so to be really specific that these are intended to be overnight, but not in any way limiting the duration or limiting the duration to simply one night at a time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, 3261, it only has emergency shelter, so we don't, that's no help. So, <laughs> okay, why don't we, um, I like the multi-room, I think we can probably work with that. Let's, uh, Pauline and Elizabeth and I will take it back to the, to the drawing board and <laughs> see how it lands. Um, but I think it, it makes sense, it describes what it is more than transitional. It's funny when, I looked at House Bill 2006, the final version and everything. They, their transitional shelter um, definition is more the outdoor shelter. 
so the, um, definition that we're thinking of, so that we took from Portland. So um, yeah, I think it's, there's a lot of confusion. I like taking transitional out because I think that um, clarifies a little more what it actually is. So, okay. Anyone have, I, I'm having trouble seeing everybody. So please just unmute and, and talk if you, if you have other comments. Okay. Okay, so moving on, um, this is where we'll have the new section for shelters. This, these are all of our temporary uses. Um, so we'll have, we'll have this in the code now or after we're done with our work. Uh, we're taking this temporary housing part out which will be replaced with all the stuff that we're working on. And we need to at some point um, come back to, let me make this a little smaller. It's a little hard to see. Okay, I know it's very tiny right now, but I just want, it's easier to see everything at once. Um, so we need to come back at some point to this temporary uses. Um, at, oh, actually this temporary group shelter um, portion. So um, we'll probably come back at a later meeting to, for this. Pauline or Elizabeth, do you want to describe um, why because of, the code on the little trippy on this stuff. So, sure. So this I, is for the warming shelter type concept, right? The emergency. Right. I think it goes back to what um, Stacy had asked about. So, if there is these temporary uses are sort of seasonal or limited in duration um, to a couple months at a time. So, if there was a need for a smoke shelter or an earthquake shelter or a, a, a <clears throat> or warming shelter, that's what the temporary group shelter would be, or if we had a wildfire or something like that. And, and um, so just for these limited duration, non-permanent, no permanent improvements made to a site um, type of uses. So we can talk, we'll come back at a later meeting to talk about, you know, what whether there are different standards um, for what would be required to be permitted as a, a temporary group shelter and how long this group thinks is the right length of time for that approval. Yeah, okay, great. So we'll come back to that. So here we go back to our, what we've been focusing on the shelter um, part. So um, here we've got all shelters must comply with the following standards. And this is, this is basically what we showed you on the slide from the PowerPoint where we had the <clears throat> must and may um, columns. So we added this management portion, which is from our short-term rental code. Um, so it's got the requirements for if, unless if there's on-site 24 seven management, that's fine. But if there's not, there needs to be some, some means of an on-call management um, and through a sign, this is similar to our code. Pauline, do you wanna talk a little bit about that or do you need to add anything if I'm missing something? No, we just um, from the last meeting heard that there will, we don't wanna require management to always be on site. So we talked about our notification process to be um, available. And so we looked at short-term rentals and our sign code to see examples and these are the two that we came up with the little a and little b of options for the um uh, the management company uh to decide on how they want to post the property does anyone have any input on on that just as i read this i, I wasn't concerned at all about the signage but it wasn't clear to me that there was an assurance to the public, if you will, that if you called a number that there would be 24 seven response. Is that what everyone else reads into this? Regarding case management, if it's not full-time on site, if I picked up the phone at one in the morning, could I count on somebody taking care of whatever situation existed? So Hans, I would say that because on-call management must be provided at all times, the shelter is open for services. If the shelter is open at 1 a.m., on-call management must be available. Okay. Answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Dana or Stacy, any comment on that since um, you both had experience with, with management 
of facilities? No, I think just to make sure, and it says it right here, it's not case management, it's management, which is correct. So I think that's a, an important, um, important language to keep in there. But no, I, I think that looks good. Okay. Okay, so just speak up if I'm moving too fast. So here we've got the restroom um, requirement, at least one toilet and hand, hand washing station. Um, and then we would require like if um, a restaurant or any commercial business had, um, you know, an out, outside porta potties um, that they would not be located within the setbacks and would be screened um, from a, by a wall or an evergreen hedge. Um, so we put in the same thing for these types of developments as well. Any comments on those? Okay, so I'm trash. Not, one quick question. On a shelter, is there any requirement for an ADU porta potty? <laughs> like if we have someone that does use a wheelchair to be able to access oh. that one bathroom on site? Yeah, I think um, the ADA um, accessible units. Yeah, I think that the um, building code um, has requirements for at least, you know, if you're going to have three standard porta potties, one has to be ADA accessible. We could get that information back to you. But usually, I think at least with the safe parking programs and the um, the two that I've I've helped process um, the provider, the porta potty provider kind of takes care of that. They know what to do, what ratio to provide. So yeah, we could, we could add something like that if we don't have something otherwise, but yeah. Uh, I can't remember if Shepherd's House, I just drove by there yesterday and I can't remember if they have one that's accessible, but I do know we have quite a few folks that are gonna use the shelter that um, do use wheelchairs. So just wanted to clarify. Yeah, let me just add a comment that I'll uh, check on that. Um, so it really should be in? the first one. <laughs> the first, if there's going to be a porta potty, yeah. has to be accessible, and then they right. can have additional. Are we going to run into any building code issues with oh, just having porta potties in some of these spaces? I haven't, I haven't worked on any projects like this, but <laughs> I'm just wondering if there was something that had to do with, you know, you have to have running water versus just kind of a sanitary. I don't think so because what we've um, I sent around the the building code for um, uh, manage uh, manage and temporary campgrounds the state um, OARs for that and so these would fall under that at least the outdoor shelter types like the veterans village or the managed camp would fall okay. under that yeah so um, we can we'll check though and make sure. Yeah, I think if it's, a, it's if, I was just gonna say, Susanna, it's likely that if you're doing a multi-room shelter or a yeah. mass shelter, there will be there will be other building code requirements that we're not mentioning in the development code. Um, that you would have to comply with to get your building permits to move forward. Yeah, so those those will require indoor toilets and running water and things like that, but. Okay. Um, I think so the, because it's camping kind of under that language, then porta potty should be okay. Okay. Yeah. But we'll double um, check on that. Yeah, go ahead. So the porta potty must be screened on three sides with an evergreen hedge or solid fence or wall. Um, I'm just worrying that that is a standard barrier that folks are not going to meet. Um, for me, maybe that screening comes into place if those porta potties are going to be used for X number of time. Um, are these, we, go ahead. Oh, we had um, a similar discussion just talking about maybe that's a good idea in, a, in the residential districts, especially okay. the RL uh -huh. um, and RS, uh, where there's a lot of single family residences say at some point, you know, Ben Lapine schools allows 
a outdoor shelter to be placed during the summer months or something like that. Um, if it's in a residential district, maybe maybe there'd be more acceptance if the porta potties were screened and there'd be a little more privacy for the residents using the facility, the houseless folks using um, the the outdoor camp. Um, so I don't know if you all have input on that. Um, but yeah, we had a little bit of the same same discussion with that and the trash receptacles. You know, if you're going to have trash in a commercial area, it would be required to be screened on all sides. But I don't know if that's prohibitively expensive. Um, and in our that's safe right. parking stuff, we're we're not exactly requiring that. I'm worried about and these standards are higher than for any other business, you know, depending on the city does not say that dumpsters have to be screened on the three sides. I can't think of any place that the city says that. There are, you know, CC&Rs in certain developments where that's the case. Um, and then, so that restroom definition, so I'm thinking about the safe parking program that we have. Mm -hmm. So would would this apply for safe parking for a church? No, so, okay, so Barb, this, the safe parking is in the municipal code and is an annual authorization from the city and no permanent improvements are intended to be made to the site through okay. that parking program. So okay. it would be the same screening requirement because that's just an annual renewing use. Um, okay. this so my so my first cons so my first thought is kind of already built into there that this only applies when they're going to be in place for a long period of time. Um, we don't need to write in there if they're going to be there for longer than some time. Um, but I do think maybe residential zone, you know, specifying that this is a requirement for certain particular area like residential zones might be the right way to go. I don't think- Just for clarification, we do require screening for trash enclosures um, oh. in all zones. Oh, um, well, It's worded maybe a little bit different here and there. Some say that must be architecturally screened. Um, that kind of puts the planners in an awkward position because what does that mean? Yeah. Um, and then other locations is where we pulled this language about it being screened on three sides with the options of, uh, you know, just a wood fence or an evergreen hedge. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry, it's hard to get you to go down this rabbit hole. Um, so what about the alleys downtown, Pauline? There are, you know, dumpsters everywhere and none of them are screened. Yeah. That's true. I'm gonna guess maybe they um, brought them in after their planning approval. <laughs> oh. Or maybe they're in the right of way and not on their property. So, okay. thank so you. That's I agree. I agree with Barb. Uh, maybe if this is in the RL and RS zone, I don't think we have to worry about it in RM particularly, but um, I could see that this could be a cost barrier, especially with the cost of lumber that I just explained before we started our meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and actually shrubs aren't cheap either. So yeah, I would suggest making it a requirement if it's in the RL or RM. I think that makes sense. And I think um, as to the issues of maybe dumpsters in some of these commercial areas, there too might be issues about access for fire. You know, if all those dumpsters were enclosed on three walls, um, how does a fire truck get in there? They can always, wheel dumpsters away and if there's no permanent structure or permanent wall, they can get their fire engines in. Maybe that's a consideration, but I do think that recognizing that RS is different than commercial um, and not trying to be overly restrictive, that makes sense, at least to me. I, I might be wrong, but I think the screening has to do with the uh, kind of the more of the public side or the, the primary street or something like that. So it's yeah, your side yard or backyard. I don't, I don't know if there's screening um, restrictions there for or screening requirements there for uh, dumpsters. If we're not going to require screening, I might suggest we at least keep it out of setbacks, um, so that 
you know, if we're not going to require anything in the RM and the RM property abuts a RS lot, um, it might be good that they aren't right on the property line abutting the single, the, the resident's house. I, I think you could add the, the language or abutting an RL or RS zone, and that would okay. kind of cover it. We can work on the language to make it sure it's code worthy. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, maybe there's something we could, I, I don't know. I, I kind of, I don't like the idea of a, of a porta potties just kind of front and center. Um, I think that even though it is a cost barrier, I think it's also a, a public relations kind of issue. Uh, and I, maybe language just needs to be cleaned up or something, but I, I, yeah, I feel like there needs to be, there needs to be something I think in there. Okay, the so challenge, have... Scott, I hear you, and I think the challenge yeah. is we need clear and objective uh, in, in terms of enforcement, in terms of people understanding what's allowed and what's not. We need to be clear and objective, and yet a part of me would love to say something about aesthetics, and, and that makes no sense, I guess, in this context, but I think that's where we're going is, you know, when we talk about livability, that's way too subjective, but these are the sorts of things that we get so much pushback from the public in general. Um, and that's where we get challenged because we're trying to write code that's clear and objective and enforceable. If it comes to that, we can't really be mamby pamby with our with our words. But that really is ultimately what we're trying to address: is the concepts of aesthetics and livability and what's it look like? You know, having a row of six porta potties next to my single family home. I mean, the reality is, folks would be upset with that. I yeah. think we know that. I would love to see Namby Pamby in our code. <laughs> yeah. Hans, that is not yeah. possible, Kathy. <laughs> Hans, I think we're dating ourselves. Okay. Oops. <laughs> um, just for clarification, or um, so if you are doing four or more units or multifamily, there is a requirement for trash receptacles. And what it states in that section is that they must not be located within the setbacks or property line shared with single family dwelling units and must be screened. Um, so it, it, you know, if you're doing multifamily, there is requirements. Um, if you're located next to um, single family residences. So that we, we do have a lot of single family residences in RM and RH as well as RS and RL. Uh, this would also, you know, if you're well, I guess some of our commercial mixed use zones, this would apply as well because they mm -hmm. are uh, allowed to do multifamily and they also buy residential. What if we took out um, the, the specifics about the screening? Um, I'm guessing this, now that I understand that yes, we do require screening all throughout the city, I'm guessing this is just copied and paste from what we require elsewhere, the with an evergreen hedge or solid fence or wall of not less than six feet in height. Um, would it be more or less advantageous to just say must be screened? Do we need to define what we mean by screened? I think it gets back to what Hans was saying, Barb. You know, it's a little easier, well, one for the planners to identify what the screening is when we have clear and objective language. Um, I mean, it could, it could be a chain link fence with slats. Um, that qualifies as a fence. So it doesn't necessarily even have to be wood or, you know, masonry by any means. It just has to be screened. And without having some type of um standard then it's it's the yeah I applicant get against the planner and the neighbors as the words were coming out of my mouth i was realizing i don't think this is going to work yeah. <laughs> they just wouldn't come back in <laughs> so why don't we um kind of work on on these two sections um i think we can revise them so that, um, yeah, with the language 
you know, maybe went abutting an RL and RS zoning district um, and come back to you with some ideas. Sound okay? Okay. Um, moving along, uh, we've got the waiting and intake area. We're not requiring it, but if there is going to be waiting um, and intake, um, any outdoor on site waiting and intake area must be sized to accommodate the expected number of people to be served. Um, Co location. So this just means that you can have, um, you know, you could have a, a warming shelter and the, on the parking lot, you could have, you could have um, a temporary outdoor shelter or some small units for folks. Go ahead, Hans. Susanna, when I read this, the, the thing that came to mind here was just imagining, again, folks are going to go to worst case. So is there a maximum number here? I mean, if we have multiple types in a very large acreage, could it be a thousand locations or 500? And I know we have a table that I wasn't able really to, to put together that the potential of how large a co-located site could be. And, and does, it, does it have a place in the dialogue? I don't know, but it was a question I think people would naturally say, well, is there any limit? And it sounds like this would be unlimited as long as it complies with other requirements. Yeah. Um... Anyone else have any input on that? Yeah, the limit would be whatever the zoning is. So if the zoning allowed 10 units in an outdoor shelter site, 50 beds in a group shelter, and 12 rooms in the multi-room shelter, that would be the limit for each, you know, each use, even if on the same site, would have to meet the requirements for that use in that zone. So there would be a limit you would look to the table for each type of use and the zone that you're in. Yeah, so I wasn't really able to, because these are all tentative numbers, I wasn't able to say, oh, well, it'd be limited to 500 or 1,000, but is, is it appropriate to say subject to zoning maximums? I, I'm just trying to be a little proactive on the sort of pushback we might anticipate. Is there something you would suggest other than or more specific than provided the standards for each use can be met? because the limitation on number of units, beds, or rooms is a standard. So um, is there something more explanatory that would get it at, at your concern there? If I'm the only one that is concerned about this, I'd say, let it go, honestly. I'm just, maybe I'm trying to anticipate too much. Um, would it make any sense to just insert um, after um, each use or zone can be met? If that makes a difference, Hans, to you, it's referring to the zone or? Well, so well again, I, I may be the only one trying to. No, I understand. I understand because it's it's similar to what I was talking about earlier about being really clear to the public of what what the intention is, but. Um, you know, I, I think this re reference might give some people reassurance that there is a control and then they'll go look for what that is. Elaine, would that, would this make sense to add? Well, they, they no matter what, are going to have to meet the underlying um, standards. So if there's setbacks, um, height, you know, they, they have to meet those regardless of how many are on site. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe this is a difficult one to just say that there's a limit. I mean, maybe we just, actually, maybe we just have to understand that people need to understand that when you roll all this up, there is a limit and we can't say what that limit is at the moment. I don't want to, I don't want to, be the one to get us bogged down here. <laughs> well, I think it, I think it's um, you know a worthy um, point for sure. Um, maybe maybe we come back to this one once we go through the tables because it might make more sense once we see the sizes and maybe do some back of the envelope math and figure out um, how big these things could possibly be. 
Yeah, Susanna, could you just put a comment in maybe that says something mm -hmm. like subject to the size limitations and, and that way we know to come back. Yeah. Be able to add something like that. Maybe the word occupancy is you know, subject to maximum occupancies or, or occupancy limit, subject to occupancy limits, something like that. Yeah, that might be a good thing to do. Yeah, okay. Because I think, I think Hans is right, you know, absolutely. There will be folks who go to whatever the very worst thing they can imagine is. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, if we can head a few of them off. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and then compliance, this is just kind of standard language. Um, everything's gotta meet fire codes. Um, and then we do have this, the development standards for the base zone and overlay zone apply unless superseded by standards in this section. So um, it all of these would still be subject to the underlying zoning standards. Um, so that might help get to a little bit of Hans's point, but I think, I think it's hard for people, you know, um, concerned people to look at this code and realize that there are safeguards kind of built in based on the size and the limits of the height and all that kind of stuff in each zoning district. So. Um, I agree, we could put something up in here that kind of talks about that. So we'll work on that and come back. Um, so we went through this may provide list, um, meals and dining areas, clothing, laundry, showers, daycare, case management services and information on referral to other community resources, overnight and day, daytime accommodations um, and kennel and open space for small domestic animals. Go ahead, uh, Hans. Oh, you're muted. My bad. Um, small domestic animals. So I don't know what small is to everybody. I happen to have a big dog. And I don't know from a practical point of view, and I understand this is a may, not a must, but are we setting ourselves up in any way for someone that doesn't have a whatever a small domestic animal is? Could we eliminate small? Or is there a good reason to say only small? Well, you don't want them coming in with a horse or a burrow or a sheep or, you know, well, it, okay. it's kind of a small animal clinic is usually a term that the vets use for, you know, cats and dogs and that kind of thing. I, I mean, I understand why they need it. Maybe there's a better, better language for it. I don't think it would eliminate a large dog. It, it's because eliminating farm animals, basically. <laughs> we pulled small domestic animal from the kennel code, I think, um, the definition we currently have. But I think if you take out small and just say domestic, you probably get to the same concept. And I did just want to point out this would not override any ADA, um, you know, uh, uh, service animals requirements that may be required to be allowed regardless of what the code's limits are. I was going to say you can also possibly say companion instead of domestic, and companion is different than um, animals. So, mm -hmm. just an yeah. idea. I was wondering about pets versus domestic animals, but companion, I think, yeah. is kind of the same as pets, right? Yeah. I'm sorry. I. Um, uh, email came in and it blocked a little bit. Of, I don't know how to turn off multiple things, but can you say that again, the, the companion? Are we putting companion in? I think companion actually has a meaning, um, not under the ADA, but potentially under some other um, requirements or restrictions. So um, I think we wouldn't necessarily wanna to limit to just service or companion animals is not the intent here, I don't think. And okay. I suppose you could have a pet tiger, but it wouldn't be a domestic animal. <laughs> so pets wouldn't work. I think the management would probably not allow, you know, um, tigers and stuff. Hopefully. Maybe that, I, means, I was just thinking, does it make more sense to just say, may allow subject to ma management restrictions or? Or we can we can add that in. 
And then it, obviously each management situation is different, but they're going to have something that I think would be explicit enough that it says that, and again, it's a may. That's true. Okay. Everyone okay with that? And then overnight camping may be provided in conjunction with a shelter in compliance with um, the safe parking program. So we're just making the allowance that, um, you know, the use could have additional um, camping in a parking lot um, in compliance with our safe parking program, which is in our municipal code, which is a little bit different. It's an annual license. <clears throat> and then we just put kind of a catch all. I didn't add storage. Um, we just wanna make sure that we're listing out enough things that if, if a shelter provider wanted to provide some of these things, um, they can go back to the code and say, look, this is, you know, if they have issues with people complaining or something, um, they can go back to our land use code and say, look, this is, this is allowed under, under their code. So we're okay with this. Um, folks okay with that? Yeah, okay, just let me know if not. Okay, so now we're getting into the individual types of shelters. So the, those that we just went through are the code requirements for any shelter basically. And now we're breaking it down into the outdoor shelter sites, the group shelter, which was the mass shelter, and then the transitional shelter, which we're gonna rename. Um, so let me go back up here. And we, we got through, um, we actually didn't go over the outdoor shelter sites. We ran out of time at our last um, meeting. So right now we're talking about, um, that's what we're gonna talk about right now. So, okay. So just backing up a little bit. Yes, Hans. So I would just say that when I looked at C3, uh, I made a note here. I'm, I'm wondering if that is maybe more parking than is necessary, which you wouldn't ordinarily expect me to question. And then in D and E3, I thought a quarter space seemed a little too little parking, but I, that comes from just, I guess, my conceptual idea of, of how many cars these populations might have. And I have really no knowledge base for that, but I just thought I'd say that those, those parking amounts seem maybe too much in C3 and maybe too little in E3 and I'll leave it at that. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, and Eric Tobiasen sent an email this morning. Um, so he, his experiences with the outdoor shelter sites and um, he had suggested uh, they have 10 at Veterans Village um, instead of one space per each. So they've got 15 residents, 15 cabins, and then um, they're, they're, uh, they have 10 because he felt like um, not everybody is gonna have a car, but we still need space for providers to come. So um, this is just a starting spot. Um, so so Su yeah. Susanna, um, my experience in other um, cities is they use a 0.5 and it is the minimum. Um, so I guess what uh, he was saying was it'd be 0.75, but I, I think 0.5 is fine for a minimum. Um, personally, uh, it is more than 0.25 and it's less than one. Um, and, you know, cause we really are talking about minimums and I think the providers are pretty responsible folks and they're gonna, pro they're gonna propose what they think will make sense. Um, you know, maybe there's 0.5 plus vi a visitor parking space per X number of units or something to that effect. But I, I think one per unit is too much personally. Okay, anyone else have um, comments on that, Dana I, or Barb? Yeah, I really like Stacey. that idea, Kathy, of at least one visitor spot, you know, some sort of a minimum um, that has to do with the answer is never zero, <laughs> you know, no matter what, you've got to have that spot for a visitor or a service provider. So something like that, I do, I think is a, is a good idea. I can tell you that um, both locations for the Kenton Women's Village does not have on-site parking for anyone. Um, it's all street. Wow, okay. 
Is is there something we could do also about making allowing the parking spots to not have to be asphalt or um, you know? I guess I'm not sure if if when we say parking, does does it have to be specific dimension with the asphalt and the and the 24 foot um, I guess aisle way if it's double loaded or something like that? Is there is there a way since this is outdoor shelter? Can we just is there a way to make it a little more casual, or is that not available in the Bend City Code? And you know, also to Dana's point, perhaps we can credit adjacent um, street parking. You know, if it's abutting the site, yeah, we can have language um, from other places in the code that we can use on that. We've got that all over the place. Okay, and that that is allowed unless we say it's not, because if you go to the parking chapter, uh, you can count up to 50%. And getting back to Scott's question, um, Pauline, do you know, I mean, part of the reason we require the ADA, uh, it's for ADA, the um, paved parking, but the outdoor shelter sites, I think, do have an allowance that they can be a graveled, um, graveled surface. So they just meet, need to meet ADA requirements. Um, so let me let me look at that a little bit more. Um, I think it may be provided in that RV um, part, those standards that I sent out to you. And I think if they're like um, you've seen campgrounds where maybe it's just you know smooth graveled lot, and then they've got like three or four ADA spaces that are paved. I think we could adjust for something like that. I don't know if that gets to what you were thinking about. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. If we have a, a couple of spots that are that are uh, required um, that have ADA access, and and I'm thinking about cross slope and all all the other things that you have to adhere to that make it pretty expensive when you could just have a gravel driveway. Um, I mean, if it's going to be tent camping, it seems weird to have kind of the Rolls Royce of, of parking spaces. And and you're sleeping in a tent, so I, just to be a little more consistent mm -hmm. with with the typology of the building or project. I have so, one clarification question on the the minimum for two. Are we saying just so when we write code, but we are requiring of just for this sake, and it could change, but a minimum of 0.5 spaces per unit plus two. So let's say oh. you need six. Um, to comply with the per unit spaces, would it be eight? So that you have the six for the units and then the two for the volunteers or staff members? Or is it just a minimum of two on site? That was what I had was thinking, was just making sure we didn't ever end up with an answer of zero is required um, because of visitors and um, services. This, it, this might be another bad idea that I wish I could have retracted. Um, what if they just have to have a parking plan to accommodate residents, visitors, and services? That I'm afraid I, that's an idea that would make your life miserable, Pauline. And, You've got these, you know, this person says, we don't need any parking because we're right on the bus line and we have on street parking. And this one says they don't need any parking for an up, for a different reason. But, you know, that's kind of what I imagine for these sites that I just, I don't want this to be a barrier, but parking can be so contentious with neighbors. It just really can make something that otherwise might fit in a neighborhood just be battles for you. And I speak from personal experience there. <laughs> so I think um, you're right, Barb, parking will be probably important to the neighbors. So having something clear about what the requirements are is best so they can say either we're meeting it or we're not. Um, and then if we did a minimum of two on site, total, let's say that's all they needed uh, because they only have four units. So that puts you at two total. Could one of those be on street? Or are we really wanting two on site? 
So for four so, units, are we saying it's okay to have one on site and that's it? So my earlier suggestion was to be able to credit adjacent parking on site. Um, I also think it might be better to be a ratio rather than a specific number. So for instance, a minimum of one space for visitors per you know, X number of units. So say if there's only five units, you just need one visitor space, but if it's 10 units, it's two, if it's you know, larger or some number that, that um, increases the amount of visitor parking depending on the size of the, of the number of units. I don't know if that's a ratio like that would be acceptable to people or not. Well, I think we're going to have to have one ADA stall no matter what. Yeah, so there's you know, a minimum of one. one visitor space. But um, that that you couldn't do if you if you didn't have a, a you know if you weren't allowed to park in a accessible space, you wouldn't be able to park there. Yeah, I get the so I get the idea of visitor, but if again we're using an assumption here whether it's 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.45, 0 0.75, we really don't know what this population is gonna be. So trying to, trying to slice it up into a fraction plus two or a fraction plus three, um, I wonder if we don't just accept that there's a number that should be sufficient and would include space for visitors because we don't wanna, we don't wanna really put too much of a handicap and be restricting how many sites because, oh gosh, if we had 0.25 parking, we could have four more sites, four more beds, four more tents. But if we go too high the other way, I, it kind of comes down to this fraction. I mean, if it's 20 units, that's 10 spaces. There's times when that might be two, two spaces too few and times when we've got four spaces empty, but it's not a science. So maybe we just need to pick a fraction that's appropriate to the best of our knowledge. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I tend to agree because if you've got a facility with, you know, 30 sites or something like that, I mean, that's, if we do one space per four, that's, that's a lot of spaces for staff and visitors that are taking up a lot of room. So, I mean, I, I, I understand if, if there's only four units, then that would be two, maybe two spaces. I, if we want to say not less than three spaces, but maybe there's a minimum. But I think because we're picking, not arbitrarily, but we're picking just a fraction of the total number of units, we should pick a number that seems appropriate to accommodate visitors. And then we can discuss whether or not it includes offsite or not. What do you think folks think about Eric's um, idea of the 0.75? Well, 10 of 15 isn't 0.75, but it's that's not, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I'm, just, I, I'm there. I'm just saying, I, let's just pick a number. It's so clear and it's so easy for people to understand that there'll be 0.5 or 0.6 or whatever. And if it includes, it should be sufficient for a visitor or two or what have you. That's all based on an assumption. Um, Maybe we could ask the Bethlehem Inn. They have so much experience of how much parking has been adequate or not over the years. Um, I, I, yeah, <laughs> parking. Ah. Yeah. I, I agree with Barb, but also that Bethlehem Inn is a different wheelhouse because of outdoor shelter versus a building. Because I'm sitting here thinking and drawing on all my experience, um, almost all of my building shelters had only street parking, um, and um, and they would just block out like paint on the curb if uh, like the ADA spot, right? Um, and uh, there was the one shelter that I ran had that had uh, 200 folks staying there. I think we had like. 25 parking spots and that was for staff visitors and uh, folks staying there. What about was, this? What if we were fairly sure based on the five months of experience we have with this council that this will be one of the 
specific parts of the of this so the whole package will eventually come to council for approval <clears throat> Both changes have to go through council and this council is very concerned about parking and parking minimums <laughs> i see dana has heard those conversations so maybe for this group we pick a number and we move on uh, you know based on eric tobiasen's comments <laughs> And, you know, I will say my own concern, I would say that number could be 0.75 or 0.5 and just kind of say council can, you know, if they don't like that number, then let's let council hash this one out. Because I can almost promise you we will. <laughs> this will be something that catches the attention of the full council. That sounds so good. 0.5. 0.5. 0.5. Okay. <laughs> Eric Tobias and I'm sorry, it's 0.66 is what. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to get back to the review process. Um, we kind of glossed over that. So for all of these, there's going to be um, some sort of review process, whether it's, um, I might ask Pauline to chime in because I'm not a planner anymore, but a type one, which is um, you know, just sort of like a minimum development standards type of thing or a site plan review where the neighbors get noticed um, within 250 feet. Um, and we're trying to get away from conditional uses, which requires a, a hearing. Actually, Scott could talk about this as well. Um, but for the, the campgrounds um, or the tiny home villages, um, you know, I don't know if the group has a feeling of how they should be reviewed or if it should be different per each zoning district. Um, they seem like more than just an minimum development standards to me, but um, I'm not sure. Uh, Pauline, do you want to weigh in or Scott? Or yeah, if, if, if the group chooses to go with minimum development standards, we have to have clear and objective standards because it's um, a, uh, not an administrative decision and so it has to say what the screening requirements are for the porta potties or trash enclosures, what the parking requirement is, it has to be very, very clear. Um, if you go into type two, there's a little bit more discretion allowed. And that is done at staff's level. Notices are sent to the neighbors. There's not a hearing unless there's um, a need to bump it up to a hearings officer. Um, so that's the differences between your type one MDS or minimum development standards and a type two. Eric's input on these type of things are just to review per the city of Bend building code. Um, so I think he's up for as little review as, as um, necessary for these. So I have a question for Pauline. Are you saying that type two gives you more discretion or is it just, um, I mean, my, my thing is to sort of lead to the least amount of uh, hoops to jump through, but given that we can't um, predict what the different options are gonna be going forward, if type two allows for greater flexibility, maybe that is a good thing to do, but I, I my question to you is, are you saying that it, if you do type two, um, there is some discretion? I believe there is more discretion allowed in a type two. Type one, there's none. So I think a decision can't be done through type one if there's discretion allowed in the standards. So if there are discretion allowed in our, in, in our standards, then it would have to be at least a type two. And so part one of the main differences for the public, I think, between a type one and a type two is that a type two is the first um, level of review that requires notice of the application to the surrounding property owners. So I'd like to hear from Hans on what his thought is on, on that for neighbors and so forth. Which aspect of that, Kathy? Well, considering that the neighbors can't stop it, <laughs> should they be notified at all? I mean, you seem like it should be notified, but at the same time, there's nothing much they can do about it. So I, I guess, um, yeah, I just wondered what your thought is on that. Well, I, I think 
we're talking about things that do fall within the land use process. So we're not talking about a 2006 or a 3261. So it seems like if we, for instance, were going to build a facility, um, we would be obliged, to, if it's type two, we'd be obliged to let the NA know and we would be obliged to comply with the 250 foot rule unless, unless there's something I'm missing here. That's for something we're building something we're converting might be a different animal. I mean, we just we just did this a little bit just recently when we said we're gonna take the winter shelter and turn it into you know, a, a, t a temporary summer shelter. I don't think we reached out to the NAs and said, hey, how do you feel about this? We assumed that Larkspur was okay with that before, so they must be okay with it now. So you're right, we're sort of setting ourselves up if we don't notify, but I would say it needs to be limited to the requirements of a land use process where and that applies. Thanks, Hans. Um, Kathy, these are these will be appealable. So, um, right, Pauline and Elizabeth, because if they're type two, yeah. If they're type one, are they appealable? Um, Elizabeth, do you know on that? I don't. No, I don't think so. Um, I believe they are. Let me just get to that part of the code. Type one appeals. Colin just raised his hand. Oh, Thanks. good, Colin. I didn't see you on. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Go ahead, Colin. Are you, maybe I haven't admitted him. Sorry, I can't see. He's multi oh, here he is. Okay, I'm gonna come up, get, let him in. Okay. Okay, hi, Colin. <laughs> Are you there? Uh, all right, I'm here. Yay, <laughs> thanks. So, um, it's, it's a little bit complicated. Type one applications um, by the code are appealable by only by the applicant. However, um, you have to be very cautious with the type one process because you, you, you're not permitted to apply discretion in the decision. It has to be very clear and objective. You know, you're just counting a setback or square footage of a lot or something like that. So if, if there's discretion that's applied, you can't use the type one because if you do, um, it could get appealed to LUBA, Land Use Board of Appeals. They'll, if they determine that discretion was applied, they remand it back to the city and tell them you have to do it as a type two. So just bear that in mind. Pauline, do you have a sense whether you think it's more appropriate to be a type one or a type two? I mean, are we clear and objective enough as it's written to even be a type one or do you think it needs to be a type two? Um, I think it, about the trash enclosures and the restrooms, depending on what we come up with that standard. And as we work through the rest of the standards, at that point, we might have a better idea of you know what the requirements are and it's going to be different maybe outdoor shelters are a type two but a group shelter is a type one it just depends on how we craft the code and then i would also look to hear what colin's um opinion is on that question too well i mean i always recommend a type two process if there's any questions um not only you know to to protect the, the process as, as it's underway but also the thing is if you if you process something as a type one and it should have been a type two, it could get appealed a year later or two years later. You, you, the, the owner and the or the developer, I guess it really wouldn't be a developer here, but the owner or operator of the of the facility would um, not have the same assurances moving forward in, into the future about the validity of the decision if there was any question about um, uh, it, the application of discretion. So I would recommend just treating it as a type two um, for the purposes of, of moving this discussion along. Um, and then we can, you know, I can continue to monitor this and just review, you know, what the, what the criteria and the regulations are. And if it, if it does present itself as being a, a completely non-discretionary action, we can, we can take, take it as a type one, but I would recommend probably just considering it as a type two moving forward. I would reiterate that I, I think if we err on the side of more notice rather than less notice, I think that makes this effort a little better received. 
Yeah, I, I kind of feel like type one is the goal, but it's just somewhat new and, and there might be some things to iron out. And if, if uh, from having that discretion available, I think it's a good idea, especially in, you know, the kind of the first rollout of this. Um, just, just for um, comparison right now in the code, a trailer park slash campground is, they're only allowed in some of our commercial districts, but and not so no residential and they're not permitted in uh, CB or community commercial. They are a conditional use in the CL and CG zones. So um, right now, just standard campgrounds are a little bit of a higher, um, higher um, bar, I guess, so. I just want to say I agree with Scott. I mean, the goal is to make it simple and get it approved like a type one, but I think we're more covered in terms of contingencies of what's what's could happen to the provider as well as, you know, some discretion on some of these items that we can't really define so clearly. Uh, type two seems to make more sense. Maybe as it moves forward, there, there is an opportunity for some of the uses to be a type one, but it seems like the consensus is that type two seems to provide the best path forward. Um, sounds like that to me. Um, the one thing is I don't, I can't see anybody's um, hands. So sorry, but if I'm interrupting, but um, is a, there's a cost difference um, and a time difference, you know, a length of time difference between the two applications. Um, so that's something to think about, but I, I do think that it's probably smart to start with a type two site plan review and we can get back to you with cost differentials, things like that. So can you give us an idea of what the difference is in cost and time before, I mean, yeah, or maybe at our next meeting, I, I'm, I don't or know. I can send it out in between or something. Yeah, I, Colin, I think, do you have those off the top of your head? Colin well, probably yeah, does because <laughs> I mean, we, we don't, it's not like type ones are not one fee and type twos are another fee. There's a, a, a wide range of fees within the type one process and a wide range of fees in the type two. And three. So it kind of depends. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I don't, we, we we probably have a fee in there for um, the, the temporary housing that we have in the code today, but it's been years since we've actually processed an application um, uh, for like a new one. Um, so I, I don't even know if that's accurate. And then this would be a new process. So, um, you know, we, we, we <laughs> I guess long story short, we don't have a fee for it right now. Uh, so well, Colin, I'm yep. just, Will this require a neighborhood public meeting too? Well, it depends. We need to clarify. If it's 10,000 square feet or larger under the code today, if it was new construction, it would. If it was moving into an existing facility, no, it wouldn't. Wonder if it's a campground type setting. No, it's based on if it's site plan review, which would be for just one site. Uh, it would it would be based upon the square footage of the new construction. Um, and then, you know, if there was a land division involved, it would require that, but usually these don't, aren't accompanied okay. with a land division. So in terms of cost, I have a question for Lynn, if she's still on there. Is this something that the applicant could apply to our affordable housing advisory committee for to offset any additional costs? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, the balancing act with that one is the readiness of the development. Um, and so if folks are not yet through any form of land use, I think typically scoring kind of leads away from funding that project. However, it's definitely eligible. Okay, because that would make, I, I think that takes the cost element out of it. It's more time and all the other aspects. I just wanted to bring that up. Um, I can get a memo out in between the meeting or just some information on the cost and the different uh, review types and um, the type one, type two, um, and what the main differences are, because I think it's useful to know these things um, as we're kind of weighing how, how they should be processed. Um, I just want to do a time check. We're at 1044, um, and I just wanted to... Um, 
I know we've got some folks in the lobby that probably want to provide some comments. So I want, why don't we stop at 1050 for that? Um, but we didn't get to this table last time. This kind of gets to number two zoning, um, but maybe we can start talking about this. We might not be able to finish it today, but um, this is sort of based on other cities and what they're doing with kind of tiny home villages and um, campgrounds, outdoor shelter types. This is sort of what we've found. Um, we understood last time um, that you wanted to um, break down the lower density residential um, and the higher density, density residential into separate categories, which um, makes a lot of sense. So these are just starting points, but for the RL and RS zones, we were thinking the maximum number of spaces or sites, cabins would, would be 15. Um, for the higher density residential, the maximum will be 50. For the CB, CC, professional office and mixed use riverfront would be 70. And then the CC and CL, those are our bigger commercial zoning districts start at 150 sites, which seems big, but Medford's urban campground, they just did an expansion to 120. So maybe we want, we want to keep it at a lower amount, but it was just a starting point for conversation. And then the mixed use zoning districts, um, maximum number of sites of 50. Um, so do folks have input? Um, of course, this is not final in any way, so just, Whatever you say today, as far as adjustments, you know, it's not the final final time you'll get at it or whatever. So, just one question, Susanna. Going forward, no matter what number we pick, um, what is the process for changing that number in the future? Is it really difficult or is it really easy? We might want to think about that when when we pick these numbers, if it's if it's very easy to say, we tried this for a year and we need to reduce this number or we need to increase this number. I just don't know what that process looks like, but maybe anticipating that we might pick the number differently if we know that it's a challenge to change it going forward. Yeah, good point, Pauline. Um, it would be a, a code update. So we'd have to go through the legislative process through planning commission, city council to change the code. So we should, probably think about being as deliberate as possible when we select these numbers. But you're right, Hans. I mean, we've done it with a lot of our uses like accessory dwelling units. We've gone back two or three times in duplexes to make it easier to um, develop after we learn of some obstacles that were in the code. So it is possible um, based on what gets adopted and the experience that we encounter with approving uh, these types of uses. I kind of wonder if maybe the number would be better suited towards uh, like per square foot of the site, uh, just because there, it doesn't really differentiate the different size sites. For instance, in RL, you could have acres and you're only allowed 15. Um, and then, you know, some of these sites might be pretty small and you, I don't know how you'd be able to fit 150 people on if it was a, it was a pretty small site. And, and as far as number goes, I, I'm, I'm drawing a complete blank because I don't really know a lot about these projects and uh, it'd be interesting to see some examples when we go over these numbers. But I, I was just thinking, basing the number more on uh, uh, property size rather than a hard number per property would probably just want to see what you guys thought about that. Most um, of the peer cities uh, provide number of sites or units, um, but it would be interesting to look at a square footage um, type of size of site comparison. Um, we could do some research and, and get back to you. So the smaller um, facilities like um, Hope Village, Opportunity Village, um, I think the Kenton Women's Home that uh, Dana worked on or um, Village are mostly like 15 to 20. Um, so that's where we got the 15-ish type of number. Um, some of the micro sites in Eugene on their 
parkland or or the city owned property are like 20, 25. Um, so that's a starting point where we thought it would fit a little bit in the RL and RS zoning districts. And then Medford's um, in their residential areas, they're more like 15 and 20. And then the large urban campground they've got is, is 120 sites. And they went through an additional review to get that. Um, so yeah, but it is a little bit of a wag. <laughs> So I, I appreciate what Scott is saying, and, and I don't know if we were to, it might be too much trouble to go and look at some of the existing examples and figure out an average like 300 square feet per spot or something that would include the amount of space a person takes up and a little bit of outdoor space or something like that. So you could say it's a ratio as opposed to a, a fixed number, and that would be more flexible depending on the size of the lot and the application. But if that's not clear, then I don't know. It, it just, I understand where Scott's coming from and, and I think it makes sense, but how we get there, I'm not really sure. Um, yeah, it just seems like a, a good, a good just point. seems like an uh, RL zone, 15 people on a large property. It seems kind of a, seems kind of a waste when you're looking at maybe smaller properties, uh, you know, in the, RM or RH zone, and then 50 people for this, you know, for the outdoor outdoor shelter. Um, yeah, it just it, it seems a little strange, I guess. Well, one clarification: we're talking about number of sites, and I'm not uh, very familiar with these. So, can you have two people in one unit? Yeah, you could have like a family unit. I mean, those okay. pallet shelters—they've got family family sizes and and individual sizes so okay so that's one clarification scott so when we say 15 it could be 15 it's 15 units but it could be four people in each of them to kathy's point um you know when we look at campgrounds and certain planning they they do set dimensions like you have to have a certain pad for the site and a little bit of space in between each unit and then we have setbacks in the parking and those development standards start dictating how many units you can actually fit on a site. And with Scott saying, you know, we do have some larger RL properties, um, would you let the standards dictate what, how many units you can in, end up having? Um, so it might be good for us to go through and identify what those standards are going to be and then come back to this section um, and, and talk about it again. That makes perfect sense, and I would agree about doing that. Okay. Um, so I can we can work on sort of an information memo or something with the cost differences of the different types, and then look at the standards and do some kind of rough calculations and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Before the next one. Okay, and I think. We're, we're out of time probably. So, and I, this is probably a good place to stop. So I think we made a lot of great progress. Let me um, stop sharing. I can. And then Susanna, do we have any public comments? Yeah. Okay. I probably do. Let me go over here. Okay, to folks in the in the lobby, um, if you wanna raise your hand and I can admit you to the to the meeting, okay. Looks like Chuck Hemingway. Um, okay, hi Chuck. Um, go ahead. Can you unmute? I'd I'd like to uh, follow up on the comment that Hans made concerning notice, and and I. For the purposes of the 20 unit uh, campsite or outdoor shelter uh, project that Square One Villages and Ben Church have proposed to the uh, city of Ben, um, we would, uh, our mindset is that we want to be good neighbors. And so we would uh, um, want to be on the side of providing as much notice as, as possible. And if we were, should happen to be sighted, in a, in a location where there is a neighborhood association, we would want to 
uh, have as a, a member of an advisory board someone from that neighborhood association and and and, be, and following uh, and being a good neighbor, perhaps join the neighborhood association and attend the neighborhood association meetings. And if we happen to be in a, a business location that we would have a, on our advisory board, a member of the business community. But uh, we would want us perhaps uh, in our mindset err on, on the side of trying to be as transparent and open and as good neighbor of, as possible. Thanks. Great, thank you. Anyone else want to provide some comment? There's a few people in the lobby. Okay. Eric, Garrity, I'm going to allow you to talk. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for all your work on this. I know this isn't an easy project uh, to work on, but I also just wanted to highlight the fact that um, <coughs> even though the low barrier shelter opening uh, in June is going to be 65 beds. We're looking at ODOT destroying um, quite a few shelters throughout the city. And then we also have planned evictions at Emerson, which is about 40 to 50 people. And those beds are not going to go very far at all. And with Hunnell and possible other evictions uh, planned, it seems like uh, I would just encourage you to take like a really maximalist approach because the need is really great. We're counting about a thousand people, but the numbers are likely higher. And so just really wanted to reiterate, like the need is very, very desperate. Um, we may be in warmer weather, but we need as much as possible and it's gonna take time to get some of these shelters in place. So just thank you very much for your work. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, anyone else? see a couple people um, still in the lobby. Okay. Well, thanks. Thank you. So let me um, go ahead and summarize uh, what we're going to get back to you. Um, we've got the notes that we'll send out from the draft, the bubble draft <laughs> um, that we'll send out. And then we'll send out some information on cost um, and what the standards will be. We can look at uh, square footage as opposed to number of sites um, in, in that outdoor shelter table, and we'll get a revised draft back to you. I also wanted to mention, um, so council has two different council subcommittees um, that have been established. They've took kind of a break for a little while, but we have the stewardship subcommittee and then the community building subcommittee. And those are just um, subcommittees. Barb, I think you're on the community building. Okay. Yeah, yay. Um, so uh, community building is, is Barb, um, Melanie Keebler and Rita Schenkelberg, I think. Um, so it's just an opportunity for counselors to dig into things a little bit more before they go to the council meetings. And so the next um, community building subcommittee is gonna be June 11th, it's a Friday from three to five. Yay. Um, so uh, we're gonna be going through um, our work with them at that point. So, um, and I think there's gonna be also um, some items on parking. So um, I, I'll send out notice to you all. You might wanna um, join in or, or listen in at least, but it, um, it's an opportunity for public comment too on, on these concepts. So I just wanted to let you know about that. And then for the next meeting, um, we'll come back with a revised draft and then pick up where we left off and try and forge through it. Um, we'll, if we have time, we'll talk about RVs um, as an ancillary use to single family and anything else we've missed, the temporary shelter concept to the emergency shelter idea as well. So um, anything else? I'm on that uh, committee um, from the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee for oh. that meeting coming up. So I will be there and um, I'll try to capture anything that we've said that didn't get communicated if if need be. Oh, great. Okay. And our next meeting is June 9th. So it'll actually be kind of good timing. We can go through this all again and then, um, yeah, go to the community building subcommittee and get more input. So, yeah. Okay. I'll use the last 30 seconds just to say thank you again. Um, our mayor refers to this process as going slow so that we can go fast. 
And I think you all understand what she means by that, what we mean by that, that example of the type one process, I thought was exactly right, where if you don't get it right in the first place, it could come back at you two years, you know, years later. And so your opinions, your experience, your knowledge is just so important and so valuable. And I know all of you are here because you already volunteer your time for our community and I appreciate it so much. So just thanks everybody. We'll see you in a few, a couple more, a couple of weeks. That sounds good. Thank you. Happy Bye. Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Without yeah. masks, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Bye everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.